I'd like to ask our next speaker to talk about what are the chief challenges the world, uh, for the world's cities and how Bureau Hopold uh, sees that. So uh, I'd like to call Jim Coleman on the stage. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jim Coleman. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you to the RTPI for inviting me to come and talk to you today. Um, I am an economist and I lead the economics group of Bureau Happold, which is an engineering company. So I'm a, an economist working inside an engineering practice. Most of the people who work for Bureau Happold are engineers. They're either structural engineers or infrastructure engineers, but we also have economists, we have planners, we have people who are experts in sustainability, urban resilience, and um, in other aspects of the built environment. We work very generally in the urban development area, in the built environment, and we do two things, really. We look at cities, and we help or try to promote the sustainable development of cities. And part of our business is called the Cities Group. That's the part of the business that I am in. And we look at cities from many perspectives. First of all, from the economic perspective. What is the economic function of a city, why is its economy changing, and how do we plan to accommodate change, to promote the positive things about change and to mitigate the negative things. We start with economic strategy, we use that as the basis for spatial planning, and we then look at how cities should be physically engineered through new infrastructure or the redevelopment of existing infrastructure in order to provide sustainable places. And we also have experts in our practice who look at how to deliver this, how to create um, agencies or operations within municipal government, for example, that can help to actually uh, provide interventions to, to implement change in cities. That's, if you like, the horizontal basis of urban development. The biggest part of our business is actually structural engineering. It's about individual buildings. And we have many experts who look at the engineering of complex individual structures in lots of different types of contexts. We have particular specialisms in complex structures, specialized structures around healthcare, education, culture, leisure, entertainment. We've worked on some very large and important structures um, in the UK, for example, the Olympic Stadium for the 2012 Olympics. We also did the engineering of um, the O2 Arena, which used to be called the Dome, which is now the most successful entertainment venue in Europe. So we specialize in looking at the basis for sustainable economic growth and then looking at how to engineer sustainable um, environments within that context. We are a UK headquartered organization, but we work globally. We have um, offices all over the world. Some of them are permanent offices. Some of them are project specific, where we have individual projects. Our offices in Europe, outside of the United Kingdom, are in Berlin, Warsaw, and Copenhagen. In terms of the work that my team do, which is about the economics of cities, the economic development of cities, we, we have a lot of experience across the world. Just a few examples here. We do a lot of work in the Gulf region. Bureau Happold has a very long history of working in the Middle East, in the Gulf. We've worked in places like Qatar, um, supporting the government of that country to help to diversify its economy through establishing new industrial zones, special economic zones. We do a lot of work around um, sustainable industrial development, economic diversification. We've done a lot of work in China. And we've done a lot of work trying to help municipal authorities in China to plan successfully for the future and in part to learn from the mistakes of large-scale developments which have not worked, which have not been sustainable, and which have not been popular. And we do that by trying to implement an economic strategy which can then be reflected in spatial development, spatial strategy. We've done a lot of work also in Russia. This was a project that we undertook for a private developer very close to Shoyumyechova Airport. And it was really an exploration of how to use a very, very large and important piece of infrastructure and connectivity, an international airport, as a stimulus for economic growth, economic development, and to try to some extent to decentralize some of the economic activity in Moscow. Moscow is a very highly centralized um, city, but the new populations are appearing on the periphery. It's causing a lot of problems in terms of movement around the city. 
We've also worked in New York City. We have a, a team in New York. We helped the, um, the Economic Development Corporation of New York City to plan for an expansion of its life sciences sector. This is a particular industry that that city wants to prioritize for growth in order to maintain New York City's economic competitiveness. And we do a lot of work looking at individual industries in cities and how to stimulate their growth. We're working at the moment um, in Stockholm and in Gothenburg in Sweden mainly for the private sector, and we're looking at the city centers of large Swedish cities and how they are evolving as places for economic activity, as places for new residential development, in the face of very rapid population change. These are very successful cities economically, but they're facing a lot of population growth pressures, which if not dealt with correctly, will start to create a lot of social and economic constraints. Finally, we also work in the UK, where we are based. We worked on a project in an area called Brent Cross. It's a very, very large um, regeneration project with a lot of housing. London has a big problem with housing. There just are not enough houses in London right now for the population, and it costs a lot of money to live there. And the future of London is really dependent on our ability to bring forward very large-scale housing development. In this case, we looked specifically at the relationship between housing and transport infrastructure. And my team worked on a business case that we took to the Treasury, central government, to fund new transport infrastructure, new rail infrastructure in this part of London that would then unlock private sector development. And the, the government agreed with us that it was a good idea and they've agreed to fund it. Our approach is very much about integrating disciplines and in terms of large-scale urban development, sustainable urban development, it's really about integrating the economic programming of places, the sustainable economic programming with the physical programming. What we see a lot in the places where we work all over the world is a tendency to prioritize physical change above an understanding of economic dynamics. If places are planned purely from a physical, a real estate perspective, they will not be sustainable, they will not work. We need to understand how the economy is going to change, how we facilitate economic change, and how we enable people to be involved in that economic change, so that the change is inclusive. It takes people, communities along with it. And the physical development, whether it's hard infrastructure, utilities, roads, real estate, it needs to be part of that economic programming. If we don't bring the two things together, we don't get the right kind of change. This graphic actually relates to a project in Saudi Arabia where they have had a tendency to prioritize physical change above economic strategy. And we work on a lot of projects that need to be fixed because the physical development wasn't really right for the social and economic context. Luckily, they have a lot of money to spend on these things so they can make mistakes. Not every country is that lucky. I was asked to talk about what I think the challenges are in urban development for the next 50 years, and we've already heard a lot about the challenges I'm going to talk about, so I'll do it um, quite briefly, really. I think there are four main challenges. The first is around population, population change. And it's not just the growth of population in countries and in cities, it's the process of urbanization which may be continuing even if the national population is not changing, the, the, the cities in that country may still be getting bigger because of urbanization, people moving from rural areas to urban areas. And ch cities are changing, they're getting bigger, and that creates demand for housing, demand for services, demand for infrastructure, and a need to make sure that different communities are integrated with each other. And cities are growing all over the world. Um, cities in Europe are growing. Um, in this part of uh, the world, some of the cities are growing very quickly. Prague, for example, Vienna seem to be growing very quickly. Budapest, not so quickly, much more stable um, growth. London and Moscow are also growing very quickly. These are two cities that are already very big and have lots of infrastructure challenges, lots of spatial challenges, and they are getting bigger. So this is, this is a whole series of, of uh, challenges that have to be dealt with through population change. But populations are not just getting bigger in European cities, they are also changing in terms of their characteristics. Populations are getting more diverse as well. As I said earlier, we've done a lot of um, 
work in Nordic cities, particularly in Sweden, which is why you see a picture of people waving Swedish flags. Oops, sorry, too quick. Um, and one of the challenges there is Sweden as a country has been very open to immigration. A lot of people have come to live in Sweden and the cities have physically got bigger. There are more people there. And the people have come from different places. They are culturally different. The ethnic mix of those cities has changed and it's changed very, very quickly. One of the challenges is when people come to the city, they decide to live there, to stay there, to settle there, they have to become part of the economic profile of the city. They have to be included in the economic activities of the city. They have to be integrated and assimilated. If that doesn't happen, it creates constraints, it creates problems, social, economic and otherwise, which eventually will become very apparent. One of the problems in Stockholm, for example, it's extremely expensive. If you come to live in Stockholm, you will not live in a central part of the city unless you're very wealthy. And if you've just arrived, you probably aren't very wealthy. You will end up living in a peripheral area, possibly with people who have also just arrived. So we start to see segregation spatially around the periphery of the city, but all the jobs are in the center. So one of the priorities is to make sure that there is very good and very easy access from new communities into employment centers to make sure that people can be assimilated into, into the economic life of the city. It's, um, it's a challenge for many cities. It's also a challenge in the UK, even though we have a very long history of, of immigration and population change. The second big driver, big factors, we've talked about a lot already, is climate, um, climate change and the need for cities to adapt to climate change. This has all sorts of implications. Um, the climate changes, it creates um, shocks, environmental shocks, there's a higher risk of flooding. It also creates some um, possible problems in the agricultural sector. The supply of food, for example, to cities in different parts of the world may suddenly change. These problems have to be addressed, have to be mitigated. These things will also create an impetus for people to move, to move from places that become challenged to places that appear to be better. So again, other, some cities may start to shrink, other cities grow. Different types of people move to cities, different types of communities. If we overlay that with other problems that happen in parts of the world, conflict, for example, conflict has driven people from the Middle East into Europe, as we've seen. Many countries have seen this happen. It creates population change very, very quickly in places that aren't necessarily used to such, such, such scale of change. And it, it creates a need to, to do something. For, for climate change in particular, the role of green infrastructure, the, the role of nature-based solutions becomes very important because these are some of the approaches to trying to deal with climate change adaptation in cities. Green infrastructure, I do a lot of work around making the business case or the economic case for investments in green infrastructure. It's challenging because some of the benefits, some of the impacts of something like green infrastructure are not necessarily easily measured or easily monetized. So we have to look at new ways of trying to understand what the benefit of this is and how it can be put into an investment decision, an investment model, whether it's on the part of the public sector or the private sector. The third um, uh, issue here that I think is important for the urban environment, and we've already talked about it a lot, it's technology. And by technology, I don't just mean smart cities. I have a bit of a problem with the smart city <laughs> because I don't really know what it is. A lot of people have definitions, but I don't really see a common definition that's applied and understood widely. But one thing we do know, though, is that technology changes and it creates technical items, technical solutions that can be plugged into the urban environment, but it also creates a lot of change. It creates change in the industrial process. Industries are changing. Some industries will start to shrink. Other industries become more important. Some jobs will disappear. New jobs will emerge. Ways of working will change. Portfolio careers, having lots of different types of jobs in your career, in your lifetime. And we need to understand that, particularly as cities are getting bigger and more diverse. We can't assume that the industries of the past that used to produce a lot of jobs will produce the same amount of jobs in the future. So we have to understand how to train, how to educate, and how to develop the skills of a changing population. So the whole idea of how we will work, 
where we will work, what kind of built environment will we work in? Are the spaces that we see here around us, are they fit for purpose for future forms of work that we don't fully understand yet? Although we don't understand exactly what will happen, we know that we will have to change, we will have to adapt. And that in itself is a skill. Services will be provided differently, particularly things like healthcare services, as populations age, larger share of the population demands healthcare, needs healthcare, they will be serviced in different ways. But do those parts of the population have access now to the technology that will facilitate their use of healthcare? One of the problems with technology right now is it creates social and economic inequalities. We all in this room probably have smartphones in our pockets and you can probably turn on your central heating right now from where you are sitting. But is that the case for everyone in this city, everyone in this country? We are all well-educated professional people. We all work in planning, we understand these things. But many cities, many countries in the world, it's not the same. Technology isn't necessarily going to have an equal impact on all of the people in a city. But all of the people need clean air, clean water, access to education, access to healthcare. The other thing about technology is it changes the international positioning of cities, international trade. Trading knowledge-based goods happens through technological mechanisms. And cities which want to be competitive need to understand how these things are going to change. Finally, because I'm an economist, I always get asked about this one, finance. Cities are changing, they're growing, some of them are shrinking, they're changing in different ways, their characteristics are changing. They need new housing, they need affordable housing, they need new infrastructure, they need more healthcare provision, they need to adapt to climate change. This all has to be financed, it has to be funded. And in European cities, in North American cities, even in Asian cities, governments don't necessarily have all of the means to fund all of these things. The, the cost has to be shared somehow between the public sector and the private sector. One thing we don't really understand enough about yet, I think, are the range of models, or the range of systems that can be used to bring finance into different parts of infrastructure or different parts of the urban environment. The public sector, the government sector cannot fund everything. The private sector will not want to fund everything. There has to be a business case. There has to be a business model that makes sense. At the end of the day, it's a partnership. It's a public-private partnership. It's a sharing. How does the public sector act in a way that de-risks good quality, long-term, private investment. These are things that need to be unlocked. There are some good examples, some emerging good examples with climate finance, for example, um, looking at ways of bringing these things together. Oops, sorry. So thinking about how the government acts as a facilitator of the right kind of private finance for different types of infrastructure um, is very, very important. So that's my take on what I think the challenges are for the future. Okay.